uh, it's my pleasure to uh, introduce uh, Nicolas Chamel, um, who is the speaker of uh, today's um, webinar. Um, so Nicolas performed his uh, PhD thesis at uh, Lut Meudon uh, under the supervision of uh, Brandon Carter in uh, 2004. And then he got his uh, PhD at uh, Pierre and Marie Curie University in Paris. Uh, and the title of his uh, PhD was Un Entrainment in uh, Neutron Star Crusts. So uh, after uh, his PhD, he went to SAMC in uh, Varsovie, uh, where he worked with uh, Pavel Ansel and uh, Les Jack uh, Zunik. In uh, 2006, he continues his research at uh, ULB, University, uh, Libre, Université Libre de Bruxelles, uh, thanks to a Marie Curie Fellowship. And then in 2008, uh, he got a permanent position at uh, FNRS. And since uh, then, he works at the uh, Institute of Astronomy and uh, Astrophysics uh, at uh, ULB. So Nicolas Chamel is an expert uh, in neutron stars. He's interested in superfluid properties of the crust and of the core. And during his PhD, he has developed a macroscopic modeling of the multi-component fluid. And uh, then he got interested in to the microscopic description of this multi-component fluid in the crust of neutron stars. So um, for his research, he's mastering uh, various domains of physics from nuclear physics to solid state physics, uh, as well as gravity in uh, general relativity. So today he will uh, present uh, his research on uh, probing uh, nuclear superfluidity and superconductivity in neutron stars. So thank you again, Nicolas, and uh, now the mic is yours. Well, thank you very much, uh, uh, Jerome, for this introduction. And it's a pleasure to uh, discuss about my favorite topic. So of course, uh, I will give some, uh, some kind of overview, but of course it is strongly biased with my own uh, personal interest. Uh, but I will try to, uh, to show you how uh, we can probe the uh, interior of neutron star and these very exotic phases uh, through observations. But uh, first, uh, <clears throat> uh, first to remind uh, what are neutron stars. So neutron stars uh, are born from the collapse of uh, ordinary stars. So they are initially extremely hot, uh, but they cool down very rapidly. Uh, by releasing uh, neutrinos. So within a few days, the temperatures uh, drops to uh, about a billion degrees, uh, which is still uh, hot. Uh, but we have to remember that these stars are very compact objects, uh, which means that they are essentially described by nuclear physics, uh, which means that the proper energy scales are nuclear physics scales, uh, MEV, which means about 10 uh, billion degrees. So. Uh, so in the following, uh, when we uh, mean uh, cold stars, uh, we have in mind temperatures uh, below, uh, let's say, uh, 1 MeV. So in fact, neutron stars can be considered as uh, cold objects in this sense, even so the, the temperature is, is extremely high, uh, million degrees uh, for mature neutron stars, uh, which means that we can expect uh, to encounter in the interior of these stars uh, phase transitions that are normally observed uh, in the laboratories in, uh, in condensed matter physics. And in particular, we expect the interior of uh, neutron stars uh, to undergo transition to uh, superfluid and uh, superconducting uh, phases, but with uh, neutrons and, uh, and protons and probably other exotic particles. So let me start uh, by reminding uh, what is actually superfluidity in superconductivity. So uh, superconductivity was uh, discovered in uh, 1911 uh, by uh, uh, Kamerling uh, Honest and uh, Gilles Holst. And uh, they uh, managed to, uh, uh, to observe uh, a drop in the electric resistance of, uh, of mercury, thanks to uh, a new device uh, <clears throat> obtained by liquefying helium. So a few years earlier, and in this way, they could manage to reach very low temperature for the first time. And they observed that there, there is a sudden drop in the, uh, in the resistance of, uh, of mercury. And they found a similar uh, behavior in, uh, in, in other elements um, the, year, uh, the year later. And they soon realized that actually these uh, properties uh, 
uh, are part of a new phase, a new state of matter, uh, which is superconductivity. Now, within the, um, uh, the following years, uh, many other superconducting elements uh, have been found. Uh, there was a breakthrough in, uh, in the 80s uh, with the discovery of uh, high temperature superconductors. Uh, there has been uh, also more recently uh, other uh, kinds of materials, uh, iron-based materials, but also uh, very recently uh, compounds, uh, including uh, hydrogen and uh, sulfur atoms with temperatures which are now uh, comparable to room temperature but at uh, very high pressures. Now, high pressure for terrestrial standards, but for a uh, neutron star physicist like me, it's actually not very high pressure as we will see uh, later on. Uh, so uh, superfluidity is a phenomena uh, which, is, uh, which are very uh, actually uh, analogous to uh, superconductivity. Uh, it was first uh, discovered in the thirties for uh, helium and uh, by different groups uh, who found that uh, below uh, uh, about two uh, Kelvin, uh, helium does not behave like an ordinary liquid. It can flow uh, without resistance, but in other uh, experiments, it actually exhibits some kind of viscosity. Uh, the heat uh, conduction does not follow Fourier's law. Uh, for instance, um, uh, helium does not boil. And helium can also flow from uh, cool to hot regions, which means that uh, this peculiar uh, phase cannot carry entropy, otherwise it will violate uh, the second law of uh, thermodynamics. So there are all kinds of uh, very peculiar properties which are associated with this new phase uh, of matter, so superfluidity. And very soon it was uh, proposed that uh, these uh, superfluid phases uh, are related to a Bose-Einstein uh, condensation, uh, recalling that uh, the, uh, the helium I'm talking about is helium-4. Uh, and uh, very soon afterwards, uh, uh, Laszlo Tisa, when he was actually in Paris, uh, he proposed uh, this, uh, the two-fluid model, so a coexistence of two fluids to explain uh, the properties of, uh, of helium. And this model was later developed by, by Lando with, uh, with great uh, success. Now, uh, incidentally, uh, in fact, uh, Kamalin Ones and his collaborators, in fact, the, sa <clears throat> the same day they discovered superconductivity uh, in April uh, 1911, they, they actually uh, also uh, discovered a superfluidity in helium but without realizing it. So they used helium to, to cool down mercury. Uh, and Honest just noted uh, uh, that uh, before the lowest uh, temperature was reached, the boiling suddenly stops. In fact, it is one of the striking property of superfluid helium. So it was in 1911, so uh, 20 years before the, more than 20 years before the, the, the experiments um, that I described uh, before. And also one of the, uh, of the visiting students in his group also observed some singularity in the specific hit in 1922, but at the time really no one really paid uh, attention. So uh, in fact, he observed, he discovered, they discovered both superconductivity and superfluidity the same day. Uh, so uh, in uh, the microscopic uh, understanding of these phases uh, had to wait for uh, the end of the 1950s, in particular, the famous uh, uh, BCS uh, theory, uh, uh, which uh, could explain uh, the superconductivity in, in materials uh, from the formation of electron pairs, which are boson and which could then uh, uh, condense. And this also suggested that uh, fermionic atoms could be uh, could also form pair uh, and form some uh, superfluid and, and um, superconductors. And this was indeed uh, discovered uh, in 1971 by Oshkov, who discovered superfluidity in, uh, super, in helium-3. Uh, uh, there was also a major breakthrough uh, in the 90s uh, with the production uh, in the lab of uh, Bose-Einstein condensates uh, by different uh, groups. Um, at uh, GILA and uh, at MIT. Uh, 
And in, uh, in, in the beginning of 2000s, there was also the, for, the production of, uh, of condensate, but for fermionic atoms. And these experiments also showed that there is a crossover between Bose-Einstein condensation and, and uh, this BCS, uh, BCS phase. So how about uh, nuclear physics? Uh, so actually very soon after the publication of the BCS theory, it was published in January, 1957. Uh, the, uh, the implication of the theory for atomic nuclei uh, were first discussed, in fact, in the summer of the same year by Bohr, Mottelson, and, and Pines. And they speculated that, uh, well, maybe this, uh, the formation of uh, nucleon pairs, this pairing, uh, could explain uh, the energy gap in the excitation spectra of, um, of atomic nuclei between uh, even, even, and odd um, nuclei. They uh, also uh, uh, speculated that this spearing phenomenon uh, could explain the odd even mass staggering and the reduced moment of inertia of, uh, of nuclei. But uh, extrapolating this to uh, nuclear matter was a huge step. And in fact, uh, they wrote that the present data are insufficient to indicate the limiting value of the gap in a hypothetical infinitely large nucleus. So understanding what happens in uh, homogeneous nuclear matter was not uh, clear to them. So in, uh, in, in the 1960s, uh, there were several superconductors uh, which had been already discovered, but only one system was known to be superfluid. It was helium-4, it was the only one. So it's, uh, uh, it, it's important to keep in mind. So in, uh, in 1958, uh, Bogolubov uh, developed a microscopic theory of uh, superfluidity and superconductivity. Um, and, 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 and he applied this theory to nuclear matter, so infinite homogeneous uh, nuclear matter. But it is Arkady uh, Migdal uh, who predicted that uh, such phases uh, could exist inside uh, neutron stars. So it was in 1959. Uh, and uh, the first neutron stars were actually discovered only in 1967. So these uh, stellar objects were still uh, speculative objects. And uh, these phases were also uh, uh, studied uh, by uh, Ginzburg and Kirschnitz as early as 1964. So again, before the actual discovery of, uh, of neutron stars. So uh, from the uh, theoretical point of view, uh, the formation of, uh, of nucleon pairs is actually quite natural because the uh, nuclear uh, interactions are naturally attractive, at least in some channels. Uh, so uh, depending on, uh, we, we can look at the phase shift and depending on, on the spins uh, of the pairs, uh, we can expect uh, different kinds of uh, pairing phases. And uh, in particular, at rather low densities, uh, uh, the, uh, the attractive interactions come mainly from the uh, spin singlet uh, channel. So we expect to have a spin singlet uh, superfluid at low densities. And at higher densities, uh, we expect to have a pairing in, in, in the 3P2 uh, channel, in spin triplet uh, pairs. So there has been various uh, microscopic uh, calculations to study uh, these different uh, pairing phases uh, using uh, diagrammatic uh, methods, variational methods, uh, or more recently, uh, quantum Monte Carlo methods. Uh, and this has been, for instance, reviewed in this, uh, uh, in this paper. So I will just show some recent uh, calculations uh, for pure neutron matter. Uh, here are different predictions for the uh, uh, pairing gaps for uh, different methods. So they are extended Bruckner trifold calculations in this uh, uh, blue line, uh, green function calculations, and uh, quantum Monte Carlo calculations here. And this uh, dotted line is just for comparison showing the, uh, the uh, results of uh, BCS calculations without any uh, um, uh, medium, uh, medium effects. So you can see that including the medium is extremely important. This has to, to, to a reduction of the gaps. And also we can see that different calculations uh, tend to predict uh, rather similar, uh, um, similar gaps. 
there are still some differences on the maximum value, uh, but at least on the range of densities for which this phase is expected, uh, the range are quite, um, are quite similar. Now at uh, higher densities, uh, as I mentioned, the pairing is expected to, uh, to be the strongest in the 3P2 channel. Uh, and here are some, uh, uh, some uh, predictions. Here the, uh, the predictions are much more uncertain. Uh, there are still some uh, suppression due to medium effects, uh, but there are uh, more important differences uh, between different uh, approaches. Um, but also it is important to realize the scale here. So the pairing gaps are expected to be about an order of magnitude smaller than uh, from a spin singlet, uh, spin singlet channel. Uh, uh, of course, uh, the interior of neutron star is not only made of neutrons, uh, despite their name. Uh, neutron stars are also expected to contain uh, protons, uh, hyperons, and possibly other particles, or even the de deconfined quarks. So there can be uh, uh, all kinds of uh, uh, of pairing phases with uh, uh, protons and neutron proton pairs, hyperons, quarks, and so on. So there is a whole uh, diversity of, uh, of possible uh, phases, but they still remain uh, uh, quite uh, uncertain. Uh, it is uh, only uh, the, the spin singlet proton phase uh, that is quite uh, well established, but other phases uh, remains more uh, speculative. So in, the, uh, in summary, uh, here is a, is a picture of the interior of a, of a neutron star. Uh, so the inter interior of a neutron star actually contains different regions. There is a solid crust, uh, where in the denser region, we expect to have uh, free neutrons. And these free neutrons are expected to be superfluid in the, in the spin singlet channel. And the uh, outer core of the star contains neutrons and protons. And the inner core uh, might contain also hyperons or other particles, and then it's more, uh, it's more uncertain. So all these uh, different uh, superfluid phases, uh, as I mentioned, um, have been predicted, uh, uh, were predicted a long time ago, um, and uh, they could be probed through uh, astrophysical observations. And uh, in particular, uh, so most uh, neutron stars are observed as, uh, as pulsars. So pulsars are just pulsating uh, neutron stars. We observe uh, pulsating signals in the, in the radio and other, also in other bands. And uh, these pulses are actually extremely, extremely stable. And this corresponds to the, uh, to the rotation uh, period of the neutron star. And, and in fact, in some cases, uh, this, uh, uh, the deviations uh, in, in the periods is actually smaller than the best atomic clocks that uh, we can uh, make on Earth. Still, uh, some pulsars exhibit some irregularities, uh, some uh, student spin-ups, uh, and, and, the and the, the, this picture show uh, uh, the, the first uh, such uh, frequency glitch that was observed in uh, 1969 uh, in, the, in the Vela pulsar is one of the most studied uh, pulsars. So you can see that uh, the student job, uh, it's typically in less than a minute. Uh, uh, it corresponds to a change of uh, about uh, one part in a million. And this has been observed in, uh, in about 200 other pulsars. And uh, so far, about more than 600 such glitches have been already uh, detected. And after this uh, student spin-up, there is a relaxation. And this relaxation, in some cases, can be uh, very long. It can take uh, uh, years. And in nuclear physics, uh, it's extremely difficult to get such very long time scales, unless the interior of the star is superfluid. So this was a very strong uh, evidence already in 1969 that the interior of the star is, uh, is indeed superfluid. And uh, to explain such, uh, such a phenomena, uh, in fact, it is supposed to be related to uh, the motion of uh, quantized vortices. So we know that when a superfluid is put into rotation, uh, there appears uh, quantized vortex lines. And the glitches uh, are thought to correspond to, to the unpinning, macroscopic unpinning of, uh, of such uh, tiny vortices. Uh, 
And this, the existence of such vortices in neutron stars was actually already pointed out by uh, Ginsberg and Kirschnitz in 1964. So uh, uh, there was also some experiments uh, to, uh, to test this scenario using liquid helium and the gross picture was, uh, was, uh, was confirmed. Uh, also what could explain the, 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 the relaxation, the post glitch relaxation by uh, some creeping of uh, vortices. And this, this is idea that were uh, developed by, uh, by Ali Alpo in the, in the 1980s. Uh, so uh, uh, vortices can be uh, pinned, pinned to what? Uh, to nuclei in the crust. And uh, here are some examples of uh, calculations that, uh, that have been made to estimate the, the pinning strengths. This has been studied uh, through various methods uh, <clears throat> using some classical approximations of, uh, of density functional theory, uh, but it still remains um, uh, rather uncertain. It, uh, it depends on the, on the layers in the crust. So there are still uh, uncertainties regarding the strengths of this. Uh, uh, of this interaction and it's still uh, ongoing, uh, ongoing research. Now, what can we uh, learn from, uh, from these observations? Uh, so these glitches, if we believe in this scenario, glitches are expected to be uh, uh, the manifestation of uh, some transfers of angular momentum between the superfluid and the rest of the star. So for, from, from pulsar timing observations, what we can extract, we can extract actually uh, some quantity which corresponds to the fractional moment of inertia contained in the superfluid uh, through observations of, of, uh, of the uh, spin frequency of the neutron star and uh, the way it varies with time, as well as uh, uh, the, the, the glitches themselves. We can also, uh, in principle, get more information from individual glitches but then it is also more model dependent and more difficult to, uh, to extract. So here's an example showing uh, uh, for the uh, observations from the uh, Vela pulsar. This is uh, the, one of the most studied pulsars for which these parameters can be, uh, can be actually extracted. And from that, we can infer that about 2% of the star, uh, of the moment of inertia of the star uh, is uh, contained in, in the superfluid. So this is a rather small number because if you think that the interior of the star is, uh, is superfluid in the crust and in the core, we would expect to have actually a much larger fraction of the, of the moment of inertia uh, contained in the superfluid. So why is it so small? So the, the, uh, the answer uh, comes from, uh, from actually the, the uh, the dynamics of the neutron proton superfluid in the core of the neutron star. Because of the nuclear interactions, neutrons and protons are actually uh, untrained by each other. Uh, and this is similar to, uh, to some phenomena, that, to, to similar phenomena that were first discussed in, uh, in the mixture of helium-3, helium-4. And uh, uh, the consequence is that the mass current of, of neutrons, for instance, is a combination of the uh, neutron and proton uh, velocities. And this means in particular that in the core of a neutron star where we have uh, neutron vortices as schematically represented here, uh, there is also a circulation of protons around and the circulation of protons means a circulation of charge, which implies uh, that the neutron vortices are actually magnetized they, uh, they carry some magnetic field. And uh, electrons, which are also present in the core of neutron stars, can be scattered by this magnetic field. And this leads to some effective uh, friction uh, between uh, uh, protons and, uh, and neutrons. Uh, and so this means that uh, neutron superfluid in the core, if this mechanism is effective, uh, the neutron superfluid cannot flow uh, completely independently but uh, it's uh, coupled by mutual friction to, uh, to the rest of the star. So this is uh, one of the reasons why only a small fraction uh, of, the, of the star is expected to contribute to, uh, to glitches. So, so this uh, magnetization of neutron vortices depends on these different parameters. And uh, with my student, uh, Valentin Allard, we have recently uh, re-examined this question 
uh, within the uh, density functional approach and the uh, time dependent of Rifak Bogolibov equations uh, shown here, uh, where here uh, H represents a single particle Hamiltonian, lambda are chemical potentials, delta is the pair um, uh, potential, and psi one, psi two are just the component of the uh, quasi particle wave functions. Uh, so these different fields themselves depends uh, on, on, the, on, on these wave functions, psi one, psi two. So all these equations must be solved uh, solved consistently. Now, uh, the superfluid velocity uh, is defined through the phase of this pairing potential. And this superfluid velocity is actually not the velocity with which uh, neutrons and protons are transported. So if we look at the continuity equation, we can extract uh, the, the true velocity of, neut of neutrons and protons. And this true velocity is actually different from this superfluid velocity. Uh, and this is related to, uh, uh, to, to, to these uh, entrainment effects. So uh, this, <clears throat> if we consider homogeneous matter as in the core of neutron stars with a stationary flow, we can actually calculate uh, these, uh, these coefficients uh, using the uh, HFB equations. And if we are at low temperatures and sufficiently small uh, currents, uh, these actually parameters uh, are uh, completely determined by the total density, the isospin asymmetry, and the isovector effective mass. Uh, and the isovector effective mass is also a quantity uh, which is related to, uh, to giant resonances in, uh, in atomic nuclei. Uh, where neutrons and protons are moving against each other. So uh, this, it is quite natural that this is also the parameters uh, that governs the entrainment between neutrons and protons in, uh, in neutron stars. So if, if this effective mass uh, uh, can be uh, uh, precisely measured in experiments, this, uh, this can have direct consequences for the dynamics of neutron stars. Unfortunately, there are still some uncertainties on, on, on this uh, uh, on these parameters. And here also we're interested in, uh, uh, in, in this effective mass uh, and the way it depends on density. Uh, also something important to notice is that this, uh, all these parameters, actually they do not depend on the, on the pairing gaps, which may be surprising. Uh, so in fact, we can calculate these, these parameters using just our tree fork method and ignoring, ignoring pairing. But this is only true at low temperatures and for superficially small currents. Uh, if we uh, go to higher temperatures and higher velocities, then it does depend uh, indeed on the, uh, on the pairing gaps. Uh, and uh, uh, my student, Valentin Alla, uh, determined the, the, the full solutions for arbitrary temperature and, and, and currents. Uh, so the, uh, there is some kind of universality uh, in, in this. Uh, uh, superfluid properties. Uh, so the pairing gaps uh, depends uh, on the temperature and on the velocities. And as is well known from the classical BCS theory, uh, if, if we rescale everything in terms of critical properties, critical temperature and critical velocities, then there is some uh, universal uh, uh, behaviors. Now, uh, the, the, the subtle point here that actually the, the, the universality in terms of velocity uh, is observed if we look at these combinations of velocity. So it's not the, the superfluid velocity, uh, but it is this effective uh, velocity from which we get these universal relations for the pairing gaps. Uh, and here for the uh, quasi particle, for the fraction of quasi particles. And full numerical results can be found in this, uh, in this paper. Now, how about uh, the crust? So there in the crust is, is, is a bit more complicated because uh, the crust is not homogeneous, obviously. Uh, so uh, if we want to, uh, to apply the, uh, the HFB equations, uh, then we, uh, and if we assume that the crust is uh, crystalline, then we, uh, we have to apply uh, the block boundary conditions. So there's a phase shift um, <clears throat> in the wave functions at the boundaries. And at the boundaries of a, of a cell, which is not a cube, it's some kind of complicated shapes. This is here the example for a body-centered cubic lattice, which is uh, the expected structure in, uh, in neutron star crust. Uh, 
So we can, uh, in principle, only solve the, the, the HIV equation in one such cell, but it is still uh, computationally uh, expensive because uh, the lattice spacing, so the distance between two neighboring nuclei can be quite large, typically 100 fermis. Uh, and the number of neutrons in the cells can be uh, also quite large, something like uh, up to uh, 1,000. So uh, uh, if we are uh, in the shallow layers of, of the crust, then the neutron superfluid is uh, rather dilute. So one can then use uh, some approximation and replace the cell by a sphere and focus on, on only states with, uh, with a zero uh, wave vector. So there has been uh, uh, various calculations, uh, in particular calculations pioneered by uh, Nikus Andulescu in Orsay and also carried out by uh, Jerome and, and Elias and, and others. Uh, and uh, one of the uh, most striking uh, results is that at very low uh, densities, in fact, uh, the pairing gaps as a function of temperature does not follow the usual BCS uh, behavior, but there is some kind of, there are different critical temperatures and there can be some reentrance of, of, uh, uh, of, of this pairing uh, phenomenon. So uh, pairing disappears and then reappears above some temperatures. So there are very peculiar pe uh, behaviors uh, at these very, uh, very low densities that cannot be uh, explained by, uh, by a BCS approach. Uh, medium effects on collective excitations have been also studied by, uh, by different groups uh, with, still within these approximations. Uh, so the advantage of this approximation is that the calculations are much more tractable uh, because it reduces to 1D. But as the density is increased, then it becomes less reliable. And because K is, there is no wave vector, the states are discrete, then it cannot be used to study the, uh, the actual uh, superflow. So another way of, uh, of, uh, of dealing with these HFB equations is to apply uh, uh, BCS approximations, uh, at least for the dense layers, where the uh, pairing field uh, is expected to vary uh, smoothly. Uh, so in this way, we can still uh, keep uh, the block boundary conditions, uh, but at the cost of having uh, the, the BCS, uh, BCS approximation. So this is uh, what I did in, in 2010. So the, the equations are similar to those uh, known in the condensed matter, the multiband uh, BCS superconductivity. Uh, the, the first uh, such material um, uh, discovered uh, was a magnesium diboride in 2001 with two bands. Here, the main difference is that we don't, we don't have two bands, but we have typically 100 or 1,000 bands. So it's, uh, it's, it's, it's more complicated to, uh, uh, to compute. Here are some examples uh, of, of, such, uh, of such kind of pairing um, for a peculiar uh, region, a uh, specific region uh, in the crust. This shows uh, the, the distributions of neutrons and protons in the Wigner site cell. And this shows uh, the different um, uh, pairing gaps for the different uh, bands and block wave vector. This is a single particle of energy here. And this is a gap one would obtain in the pure, uh, pure neutron matter. So there is some reduction of, um, of the gap, um, but uh, we observe that the, the, the gaps uh, still follow the, uh, the BCS, uh, universal BCS relations, and also the, the critical temperature for also follow the, the classical BCS, uh, BCS results. Uh, if we look at the uh, pairing field, uh, we see that the, the pairing field is, uh, is indeed homogeneous, fairly homogeneous. Uh, and if one uses the local density approximation, then uh, uh, the results could be uh, quite different. And this is uh, uh, because there are uh, proximity effects. So the size of the Cooper pairs is actually quite large. So uh, uh, the local density approximation is not uh, a very good approximations here in these layers. And so how is it, as we increase the temperature, uh, the brain field becomes more and more homogeneous uh, until uh, just the uh, brain vanishes. Now, how about uh, the superfluid properties themselves? So uh, in fact, because of uh, these inhomogeneities, uh, 
the neutron superfluid fraction is actually reduced. So this means that the neutron mass current in the cross frame, um, uh, this is proportional to the superfluid velocity with some density, which is actually different from the neutron density. And this can be uh, calculated. Uh, so in the uh, low density uh, layers, uh, so the calculations, uh, the first calculation I did was in uh, 2012, where I ignored uh, actually pairing, the pairing gaps. Uh, and uh, uh, in these calculations, uh, I found that in the low density regions, the superfluid fraction is, is quite high, about 80%. Uh, and the spectrum is actually uh, very similar to that of uniform matter. It's just a, uh, just a different way of representing the, 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 the spectrum. But as we go to higher densities, then the superfluid fraction can be very much reduced uh, up to uh, down to 7% in this, uh, in, this, uh, uh, in this case. So this means that uh, superfluidity is almost entirely suppressed, even though the pairing gaps is, is finite. So it's, uh, the flow, uh, so the system is superfluid, but the, the, the superfluid flows with the crust. So this has been also studied with different approaches, uh, hydrodynamical uh, approaches, pure hydrodynamic descriptions. Uh, and these uh, hydrodynamic descriptions uh, led to somehow uh, different uh, conclusions, much larger superfluid fractions. But one has also to keep in mind that the hydrodynamic description applies uh, if the coherence lens is, uh, is much smaller than any other lens scale in the system, uh, which is not necessarily the case here. So the, the coherence lens can be actually uh, quite large, uh, larger than the size of the, of, of the clusters. So it's not completely clear that this approach can be actually uh, applied reliably in, um, uh, in the crust. Um, more recently, there has been uh, HFB calculations uh, of these superfluid fractions uh, at the same density that I showed earlier. Uh, and it was found that uh, um, the, the neutron superflow is uh, indeed more strongly perturbed than uh, predicted by uh, pure uh, hydrodynamics, but much less than uh, what uh, I found uh, before uh, ignoring pairing. So we found about 7% for this peculiar density, while these calculations led to much larger uh, superfluid fraction of 60-70%. Uh, now, uh, there was also a number of approximations that were made in, this, uh, in these calculations. Uh, in fact, the calculations were restricted to one-dimensional lattice, not 3D lattice. Uh, the effective mass was approximated by the bare mass. Um, also, the potential were treated, each Fourier component of the potential were treated uh, independently. So there was a number of approximations, and at the end, it was not uh, really clear how reliable are these uh, approximations. So this is why I have actually uh, repeated the calculations. Uh, so still in, uh, so keeping the full 3D lattice with the same uh, potential uh, effective mass I used in 2012 but now included uh, explicitly uh, pairing. And uh, here are uh, some results uh, for different uh, values of, of the pairing gaps. And the superfluid fraction still remains very small. In fact, it doesn't depend much on, um, on, on the pairing gaps. And this is uh, similar, in fact, to what happens in, uh, in, uh, in the core of neutron stars, where the superfluid fraction, these entrainment parameters, is uh, also found to be uh, actually independent of the, of the pairing gaps. So including pairing is actually quite costly, uh, but at the end of the day, it's, the result seems to be uh, very similar to, to, to what I found before. So what does this mean? So, uh, uh, so this means in fact that in, in the crust, uh, as I said, neutrons are superfluid, uh, but they are somehow locked to the crust, so this is this put a very strong constraint on the interpretation of, uh, of pulsar glitches. Uh, this is summarized in, in this diagram here. Uh, uh, so when, when these effects are taken into account, all the shaded regions here are excluded. And uh, uh, the, uh, the model that can explain the data should lie in this region above. And the, the, the lines corresponds to different equations of state. 
So this would mean that the, 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 the pulsar should have a mass which is lower than one solar mass. And this is quite difficult to explain from supernova simulations from which we expect to have neutron stars uh, with masses uh, larger than one solar mass. So the conclusion, uh, if, if we uh, believe in these calculations, uh, is that somehow some part of the core should, be, uh, should also contribute to, uh, uh, to pulsar glitches. Uh, and uh, we can uh, try to, uh, to uh, uh, have more constraint on, on, on the physics of, of these uh, superfluids from actually uh, the, uh, the short time scale during which uh, the uh, pulsar spins up. And in particular, there has been some observations some years ago, uh, again on, on the Vela pulsar. Uh, we, we, we showed this uh, peculiar, uh, some overshoot and some fast uh, relaxation following the glitch within a very short time scale, it's, uh, within a minute. And there were also some uh, uh, some interesting, uh, some kind of delayed uh, spin-up observed in the crab, uh, in the crab pulsar, and different glitches, in fact. And these uh, peculiar phenomena, uh, in fact, they can be uh, explained if we consider that uh, neutron vortices uh, in the core of neutron stars, they actually can interact with proton flux tubes. So if we assume that protons from a, a type two superconductor, which is a, a standard assumption, this means that we expect to have quantized proton flux tubes. So neutrons can interact with these flux tubes and depending on how they interact, we can actually uh, uh, reproduce uh, the, the, the different behavior, the different uh, spin-ups observed in the crab and in the Vela pulsars. Now the, the, the model that we use still remains uh, very schematic and, and simplified. So uh, this still needs to be uh, confirmed by more detailed models. But this is uh, still some kind of interesting prospect for uh, uh, better probing this, uh, these phases. Now, I should also mention that there are alternative explanations to this phenomena. So uh, this is still um, uh, an open question to, uh, to, to fully understand this, uh, this peculiar um, behavior. Now, there are other uh, observations from which we can, in principle, uh, probe superfluidity, for instance, precession. So long-term uh, variations um, observed in, in a few uh, neutron stars. Uh, so very long-term means uh, months to years uh, variations. Uh, an example is, is shown here. Uh, and this uh, has been interpreted as precession. Now, uh, if, uh, if the interior of the star is, uh, is uh, superfluid and if they are uh, proton flux tubes, then uh, we expect uh, the, the, uh, the typical uh, uh, period of, of precessions to, to be actually much shorter than the rotation period, which should be somehow in, in, in contradiction to what is observed. And this would suggest that either there is no superfluidity or there is no uh, flux tubes um, but this is not completely clear because, in fact, uh, it was also shown that uh, if there is precession, then the precession itself uh, could unpin vortices. So uh, it, it is uh, hard to draw a uh, conclusion, unfortunately. Now, the, probably the, the, the most convincing uh, evidence of superfluidity, apart from, uh, from pulsar glitches, uh, come from the, uh, the cooling of neutron stars. So they're initially very hot, uh, but they cool down over time. And in particular, the neutron star lying in uh, this white dot here uh, is the neutron star lying in the, in the remnant of the supernova uh, Cassiopeia A. Uh, and this neutron star has been monitored for, uh, for decades uh, and from which the temperature uh, has been inferred. And it turns out that the neutron star is actually cooling uh, quite fast. And this is interpreted as, as uh, uh, the manifestation of uh, the transition to uh, the uh, 3P2 uh, neutron su uh, superfluid phase. So, uh, so in fact, measuring this, this fast cooling gives a very strong constraint on the critical temperature of this, uh, of this neutron superfluid phase. There's also interesting uh, observations from uh, neutron stars accreting matter from companions. Uh, in so-called uh, uh, soft X-ray transients. Uh, 
So in such systems, a neutron star accretes matter from a companion, but the accretion uh, is not continuous. So from, from time, uh, after some years, the accretion can stop. Uh, and during the accretion, the crust is uh, heated out of equilibrium. And in the quiescent phase, when there is no accretion, uh, the crust uh, cooled down. And this uh, cooling uh, has been also, also monitored for about a dozen uh, systems. And this uh, provide uh, convincing evidence for superfluidity in the crust. So from, from the neutron superfluidity in the crust. So these are uh, independent way of, uh, of probing uh, also the uh, neutron superfluidity. Um, another uh, way of, uh, of trying to, uh, to probe the interior of neutron star is through uh, oscillations. And uh, some years ago, uh, such oscillations uh, were detected in, uh, in strongly magnetized uh, neutron stars. Um, and uh, it, here is an example showing uh, the uh, uh, X-ray uh, spectrum. Uh, and you can see uh, characteristic, uh, well, peaks corresponding to uh, characteristic frequencies, uh, which uh, have been interpreted as oscillation frequencies of the neutron star itself. So the game is to try to reproduce these frequencies. Uh, now this is uh, very difficult because it's, it's, uh, uh, it's not completely clear if these are uh, crust oscillation modes or oscillations of the core or uh, most likely coupled oscillation of the crust and the core. Um, but uh, it seems that uh, uh, these oscillations uh, are indeed the signature of such uh, neutron star uh, modes uh, involving uh, the magnetic field, but also uh, superfluidity. But the uh, uh, interpretation is still uh, difficult and, and challenging because there are lots of physics uh, contained uh, contain in, in, um, in, in, such, uh, in such stars. So, but at least, in, at least it is interesting. Uh, prospect uh, independent from, from pulsar glitches and, and the cooling. So in, uh, uh, in summary, uh, so uh, nuclear superfluidity and superconductivity in neutron stars are whether well established. Uh, uh, they were predicted uh, a long time ago in, uh, in 1958. So only two years after the publication of the BCS theory and even before neutron stars were actually uh, discovered. Um, these, uh, these phases have been also confirmed uh, by uh, different kinds of observations, uh, pulsar glitches, as I mentioned, uh, but there are also other irregularities uh, that may be uh, related to these phases. Neutron star cooling provides also uh, uh, very convincing evidence for, for these phases, uh, uh, but there are still uh, lots of uncertainties uh, on, on the understanding of this phenomena. Uh, both from the nuclear physics side, but also from the global modeling of, uh, of neutron stars. Uh, and the main challenge uh, is to relate uh, the nuclear physics at the scale of, uh, let's say, Fermi, Fermi scales, hundreds of Fermis, to the scale of the star about you know, 10 kilometers. Uh, and, and at this scale, we should also take into account general activity. And so combining all of this physics is extremely challenging. Uh, but hopefully uh, we can also get uh, uh, in the near future uh, new uh, observations with uh, third generation gravitational wave uh, detectors from which we can really hope to, uh, uh, to, to do some kind of seismology of, of neutron stars and to really try to uh, uh, better understand uh, these phases. But uh, there are still many uh, unknowns on this problem, very exciting physics to, uh, to better understand. So uh, uh, it's, uh, it's still a very open, uh, very open field. So thank you very much for, for your attention. If you have any question, I would be pleased to, uh, to answer.